In today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA's updated timeline for the Artemis moon missions, SpaceX working with the US Air Force on point-to-point -point space transportation, Sony making orbital photography accessible to Earthbound artists, and NASA's Inspector General warns we might be running out of astronauts. This is The Space Race. The United States Air Force has awarded SpaceX a $102 million five-year contract to demonstrate technologies and capabilities to transport military cargo and humanitarian aid around the world on a heavy rocket. The rocket cargo program is led by the Air Force Research Laboratory and is investigating the use of large commercial rockets for global logistics. To determine exactly what a rocket can achieve when used for cargo transport and identify factors like the true capacity, speed, and cost of the integrated system. Basically, they want to figure out if the SpaceX Starship can be a better vehicle than the traditional cargo plane for moving both people and stuff around the world. The idea is that Starship would launch into space from one location on Earth and then immediately come back down to land at a different location. In theory, we can travel halfway around the world in less than one hour. This is the largest contract awarded to date for rocket cargo and is not specific to any of SpaceX's launch vehicles. Though I would say it's pretty obvious that they are eyeing up the Starship, so far, it's the only rocket in existence that is designed to land with cargo. AFRL will have access to SpaceX's commercial orbital launches and booster landings to collect key data on environmental signatures and performance. The contract also includes an option for a full-up demonstration of heavy cargo transport and landing. So the first point-to-point -point flight by SpaceX may be funded by the US Air Force. Significant heavy cargo from orbit has never been previously attempted, so we don't know what's going to happen. The ship is really designed to land on Mars and the Moon, both of which have significantly thinner atmospheres than Earth and a much lower force of gravity. So landing on Earth will fully stress the thermal protection system, landing propulsion, and landing legs of the ship. I mean, the worst case scenario, though, would be that it explodes, and we've already seen that happen to like half a dozen starships already, so wouldn't be anything out of the ordinary for SpaceX. Every year, most people set New Year's resolutions, but around 80% of these will get abandoned in just the first two months. And this is why we're really excited to tell you about our new sponsor, Fabulous App. The best way to succeed with your resolutions is to transform them into tiny habits and stick to them. The Fabulous app was developed by behavioral scientists at Duke University and has guided journeys for common resolutions like exercising more, improving your sleep, and eating healthier. You can choose habits recommended by Fabulous or create your own routine for the morning, afternoon, or evening. And every day, you can get short two to three minute coaching sessions designed by the Fabulous behavioral science team to help you get ready for your day or wind down and relax at night. Staying accountable can be tough Tough. So I find joining challenges with hundreds of other fabulous members as a fun way to stay accountable and help me succeed. Working out and developing a better fitness routine is at the top of my list for 2022 and Fabulous is helping me with that New Year's resolution. I love how everything I need to work out is all on one app all while keeping me accountable and helping form better everyday habits. There is no better investment than in yourself, so start building your ideal daily routine today. The first 100 people who click on the link in the description will get 25% off a fabulous subscription. And now, let's get back to the video. We've got some new details about the Artemis moon mission that were discussed at a meeting of the NASA Advisory Council's Human Exploration and Operations Committee January 18th and 19th. We know that the Artemis program has been going through a bit of a rough patch with delays and technical issues, but NASA seems to be fairly confident right now about their updated timeline. According to what officials call a working manifest, the first crewed mission to the moon, Artemis 3, is scheduled for launch in mid-2025. That's a one-year pushback from the original goal, but not nearly as long of a delay as many have been warning. 2025 does still sound ambitious, but we're willing to go along with them. 
Where things start to get more interesting is with the updated mission of the Artemis 4, which NASA has now confirmed will not be conducting a lunar landing. Instead, Artemis 4 will be devoted to assembly of the Lunar Gateway Station. The mission will deliver the IHAB Habitat module developed by the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency JAXA to the Gateway in orbit around the Moon. The station will serve as a hub for future crewed missions to the Moon and facilitate crew transfers between the Orion spacecraft and the human landing system. This also gives scientists a permanent research facility in lunar orbit. The first two sections of the gateway, the power and propulsion element and habitation and logistics outpost, which will launch together on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket in late 2024 and spend a year spiraling out to the near rectilinear halo orbit around the moon. Artemis 4 will dock with these first gateway elements when it arrives in what should be 2026. Artemis 4 will also be the first flight of the Block 1B version of the space launch system which replaces the interim cryogenic propulsion stage used on the first three SLS launches. That enables Artemis missions to carry additional payloads along with the Orion spacecraft, such as the IHAB module. Another reason for not including a landing on Artemis 4 is going to be the availability of a lunar lander. NASA's Human Landing System Option A was awarded to SpaceX last year, but only covers the development of one lander and a single crewed flight on Artemis 3. NASA will support future landings through a separate effort called Lunar Exploration Transportation Services. The goal of LETS is to select one and possibly more companies to provide sustainable landing services. That second lander opportunity has been opened up to design proposals from all of the usual suspects, Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, Sierra Space, and everyone else who lost out to SpaceX on the first lander project. NASA seems to expect the Let's Lander to be ready for the year 2027, meaning it should be able to fly with Artemis 5. That would make Artemis 5 the first Artemis mission to both use the gateway and have a lunar landing. That mission, according to the Working Manifest chart presented at the NASA meeting, will also include delivery of Europe's Esprit refueling and communications module and a Canadian-built robotic arm system for the Gateway, as well as an unpressurized lunar rover. All of these future missions and the manifest that is on the table right now greatly depends on the progress NASA makes on the initial Artemis missions, starting with Artemis 1. That uncrewed test flight of SLS and Orion does not have a formal launch date, but Jim Free, NASA's Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development, told the committee NASA was looking at March or April for the launch. In advance of that first flight, we are expecting to see NASA roll out the SLS to Launch Complex 39B in mid-February for a fueling test and practice countdown called a wet dress rehearsal. After that test, the SLS will go back to the vehicle assembly building for final preparations before returning to the pad for the launch. If the Artemis 1 launch goes according to plan, then it will send the Orion spacecraft on a three-week trip to orbit the moon and return to Earth for an ocean splashdown. Sony Electronics have plans this year to launch a small CubeSat into orbit that will be equipped with one of their full-frame cameras and a zoom lens. This is part of their StarSphere project that seeks collaboration with artists, entertainers, and educators. The collaborative aspects of the camera satellite comes with an online controller for the camera that connects through a ground station in Japan, enabling selected users to capture and record the Earth and stars using a broad range of camera work options. By operating the actual satellite via simple controls while watching live video in real time, users will be able to freely compose shots, move the satellite's camera, choose the settings they want, and shoot the Earth's diverse landscapes, scenery, and sunrises as seen from space. The camera will be able to point freely anywhere over a 360 degree range, enabling it to be directed at not just the Earth, but also the horizon and outer space. Users will be able to freely engage in camera work from a space-based perspective with pan, 
tilt, and zoom operations. Users will be able to adjust camera settings like the ISO, aperture, and shutter speed at their discretion, same as any other digital camera. When the satellite passes over a ground antenna, users will be able to operate it directly for a period of around 10 minutes while viewing actual live images from the onboard camera, allowing them to experience a direct connection between space and life on Earth. At this point, I'm not sure how you sign up to get access to the camera, but this is such an amazing idea, I would absolutely love to try it out. The size of NASA's astronaut roster may soon fall below the minimum level the agency needs to support the ISS and Artemis moon missions. At least, that's what the agency's Inspector General warns in a report released January 11th. The inspector found that the agency's astronaut corps, which is currently just 44 active astronauts, could fall below the minimum manifest requirement needed to adequately support International Space Station and Artemis missions, and that could happen as soon as this year. The astronaut count at its peak in the year 2000 had nearly 150 astronauts, but is now at its smallest size since the 1970s. NASA has been trying to head this off by recruiting a new class of astronauts in December 2021. Those new recruits begin two years of training this month. However, by the time those new astronauts are eligible for flight assignments in 2024, NASA will have to contend with both continued attrition of the current flight crew and the demand for additional astronauts for the Artemis missions as they progress. NASA has yet to select astronauts for the Artemis 2 and 3 missions, now scheduled for 2024 and hopefully 2025 respectively. While those missions are still at least two years away, NASA could be overestimating the amount of time available to develop and implement the necessary training regimen for them, the report concluded. It noted that early in the ISS program, training for missions was up to five years long before being streamlined down to the two years for current missions. The report did not specifically recommend NASA increase the size of the astronaut corps beyond the new class that just started training, it did, however, recommend NASA reevaluate the 15% safety margin currently used for determining the size of the roster, along with recommendations on improved collection of astronaut demographic data and new guidance for evaluating training. NASA, in a response included in the report, said it accepted the recommendations. So what do you guys think? Does nobody want to be an astronaut anymore, or are we just less likely now to go after big ambitions? I bet if you're watching this video, you had dreams at one point about going to space. I know I did. Looks like we should have gone for it. Apparently, the job opportunities would have been there after all. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.